We're going to continue on as God leads us in our sermon series on the seven deadly sins as we look at the sin of sloth. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 13. It's going to be from verses 17 to 33, and we're going to skip a couple verses there in between because I can't pronounce the names. So we're going to skip those. Um, But all of God's word is profitable for teaching. Just remember that. Numbers chapter 13, verses 17 and following. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negeb and up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds and whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are trees in it or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. And going to verse 25. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from spying out the land and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from the Nephilim and we, seem to our, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers and so we seemed to them. Let's pray. God, forgive us when we see that your hand is short, short-handed. God, forgive us when we don't see that your promises are true. And God, I pray that as we continue to look at this passage this morning, Lord, that you would convict our hearts, God, as we don't stand condemned, but Lord, we do stand convicted. And I pray that your grace would be sufficient for us this morning. I pray for Pastor Trent, God, thank you for the work that you have done in his heart this week. I pray that we would see that work, God, and we would see how that applies to our lives as well. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. see a deadly sin on every street corner, in every home, and we tolerate it. We tolerate it morning, noon, and night. Well, not anymore. Well, what comes to your mind when you think of that word sloth? If you're an animal lover, you might think about this creature, not that one, but that one. (laughs) It's a great picture of a sloth, isn't it? Uh, This two or three toed creature that hangs from trees all day and basically doesn't do much else beyond that. Or if you're a child of the 80s, when you hear the word sloth, you might think of this guy, not him, this guy, the uh, great character from the Goonies, who, as I was doing some research this week, when I should have been doing something else, learned some really interesting facts about him, and uh, don't look them up while I'm preaching today. (laughs) You may, though, be thinking about, those of you who are younger, you may be thinking about this guy. This is uh, Flash Slothmore. He is that lovable sloth from Zootopia who speaks really slowly and laughs even slower and carries around a mug that says, you want it when? And works at none other than the DMV. (laughs) The Department of Mammal Vehicles. It's one of the most brilliant animated pieces of comedy ever. 
So, uh, but of course, none of these sloths are what we're talking about this morning when we're talking about the sin of sloth. When we think about the sin of sloth, what might come to your mind is that person who is what we call a couch potato, and they actually aren't all that distinguishable from a regular sloth. They spend 15 hours a day sleeping, they eat mostly only at night, and only get up to go to the bathroom. That may be what you have in mind. And in fact, such a way of being in the world very well is slothful, as the Bible would describe it. Um, the Bible actually calls this type of person the sluggard, and Proverbs refers to them this way. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. It's a great picture that will now come to your mind every time you roll over to hit the alarm clock snooze button and then roll over one more time and you find there's a fair amount of movement but never any progress. The, the slugger doesn't make any progress because he's firmly fixed like a hinge to his comfort zone. So doesn't actually go anywhere, doesn't move forward, just flops around. Now that might sound to you like a colossal waste of life, who would spend their life just simply vegging and being, you know, not doing anything, but really is this a sin? Is this that big of a deal? In fact, some of you type B folks might feel like this is a conspiracy of type A people against type B people <laughs> to call things like relaxing sloth, and that's not what we're doing. If you remember, I referred last week to those Harper's Magazine ads from 1987, and they their ad for, for the sin of sloth goes like this. If the original sin had been sloth, we'd still be in paradise. <laughs> you might disagree in the, as I do with the theological implications of that statement, but uh, that's kind of how we think about sloth. It's not really that big of a deal. In fact, you may agree with Evelyn Waugh's assessment of sloth when she says, most of the world's troubles seem to come from people who are too busy. If only politicians and scientists were lazier, how much happier we should all be. I don't know so much about scientists, but certainly sometimes I feel like if people in Washington were not doing so much, we might be better off where we are. But sloth is, in fact, a problem. And it's not just a problem, it's a sin. And it's not just a sin, it's one of the seven deadly sins from which every other sin ultimately funnels down through. And like every sin, in fact, ultimately leads to death. So what exactly is it? Is it just the couch potato, the person who's like a hinge, flopping back and forth and never actually going anywhere? If you think that, you've not quite grasped the biblical understanding of this particular sin. The fact of the matter is, you can find people who are slothful at the gym every morning at 5 a.m. And you can find people who uh, struggle or don't with the sin of sloth, who are writing books and leading large companies and organizations and working 100-hour weeks and achieving goals and everything else. You will find people who are slothful, who would never come away from the TV, and others who are slothful who will never actually set themselves in front of it for a minute. So what exactly then is this sin that can seemingly capture all those kinds of people, both the driven and those who don't seem to be driven at all? Well, there's an interesting and long history on the sin of sloth and various words that have been used to describe it. Words like acedia, which comes from a word that means a lack of caring. The word apathy, which is very similar, of course. Uh, even concepts that are close to what we might call depression and um, uh, and, and laziness. All, all of these terms kind of make up the orbit of what sloth, as we're going to talk about it, is. But here, for our purposes, we're going to define it this way. Sloth is avoiding the responsibilities that loving God and loving neighbor require. Sloth is avoiding the responsibilities, the demands that loving God and loving neighbor require. And as you start to wrap your mind around this, you'll begin to see how exactly this sin manifests itself in your own life. But with that definition, there are a couple of things that you should notice. The first is, of course, that I'm assuming that God has made us and that we owe him something. And namely, Jesus sums that up when he sums up the moral law revealed in scripture. And that is that we owe him love 
and that we owe the same to our neighbor. We're to love God and we're to love our neighbor. And so sloth strikes right at the very heart of the, of the reason why God made you. You exist here to glorify him, and the way you do that is by loving him and loving your neighbor. And sloth is the avoiding of doing those very two things. The second thing you should notice about this particular sin is that it's unique among the seven deadly sins and that this is the only one of them that is not a sin of commission, something you do. It's a sin of omission, something that you don't do that you should be doing. Sloth is really about the things we aren't doing but should be doing out of love for God and love for our neighbor. The other sins, of course, are things that we're actively doing and engaged in. Sloth is when we know that something needs to be done for our church family, but we just wait and expect that somebody else will step up and do it. Right? Sloth is we know we need to have a conversation, but rather than doing it, we avoid it and let things simply take their course. It's not doing what we really ought to be doing. So with that, let's look at our story from Numbers 13. This passage begins before we actually started reading, but in chapter 13, verse 2, God tells Moses to send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. This is fundamental to the mission that the people are doing as they go into Israel. God says, I'm giving you this land. Now send people in to go and scope it out. So Moses does, and the people, they go into the land, and they scope it out, they see what all is going on there. In fact, they discover the amazing fruitfulness of the land, so fruitful, in fact, that they come across a cluster of grapes that's so large, they have to tie it to a pole, and two men carry it on their shoulders. This is an amazing promised land that God is giving to them. They describe it in verse 27. We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. In other words, it's exactly what God told them it would be. It's going to be awesome, and it's for you. Now, in the midst of this mission, they discovered, however, that not only was the land fruitful and amazing, but there were actually already people living in it. Now, they knew this already, at least intellectually, because God told them that he was sending them into the land to ultimately be his agents of judgment against the wicked people who were already occupying it. And so when they discovered that there were people already living in the land, rather than just accepting that as a fact, that this is one of the things they're going to have to deal with when they go in, instead, it became a wall and a reason not to go. Verses 28 and 29 describe it this way. These are the words of the spies. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negeb. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and all along the Jordan. So they report this news in the kind of way that an older sibling tells their younger sibling about the boogeyman. The, the purpose is not to inform them, the purpose is to scare them. And so they're reporting this news in such a way as to provoke fear in the heart of the people, and that's exactly what they do, and it causes some kind of commotion. The people are they're rising up in protest. We're not going into that land. We're not gonna do this. We're not gonna fight them. Now, there's one man who's not uh, scared by the report, his name is Caleb, and this is how he responds in verse 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. This is the minority report, right? He's the guy who's actually listened to what God said. I'm giving you this land. I'm gonna give all your enemies into your hand. And Caleb understands that it doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. God never told us it's gonna be easy to go up and take the land, but what God told us is he's gonna be with us when we go and fight these enemies. In fact, he's gonna be for us and he's gonna fight for us. So let's go up and do it. We can do it and, and not just we can do it, but we're well able to overcome it. Well, the people weren't inclined to listen to the voice of truth and so they say in verse 31, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out saying, 
The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seem to them. So they strike fear in the heart of the people. And the people then avoid doing what love for God requires. And that is to go in and take the land that he's promised to them. Now they think by avoiding doing what love for God requires that they're making their lives easier. And what instead do they discover? They've made their lives significantly harder and they're now going to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years until all of those who would not go up die there. That's ultimately what the sin of sloth leads us to. It promises that life's going to be easier. We can avoid the hard thing. We can avoid sacrifice. We can avoid costly things that God calls us to do and our life will be easier. And the truth is, no, when you avoid the hard and the costly and the good things that God calls you to do out of love for him and love for neighbor, your life gets worse, not better. Because it's sin. So with that by way of background, We're now going to use the book of Proverbs to be our guide to discover what are the symptoms of sloth at work in our lives? What is the uh, deeper underlying heart uh, sin that's at work when it comes to sloth? And then finally, what is the cure? Let's start with the symptoms of sloth. There are many different symptoms of sloth that may suggest that this sin is at work in your life. We're going to just simply look at five of them. And the first symptom is a refusal to act, a refusal to act. That's what's happening here with the people of Israel, specifically a refusal to act due to fear. God says, I want you to go up and take the land. The spies say, we can't go up and take the land. There are bad people and tall people there. And so the people are afraid and they are not going to go up. They refuse to act on what love for God requires because they're afraid. Proverbs attributes this quality to one called the sluggard. Again, in Proverbs 26, 13, it says, the sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. There's a lion in the streets. You might've heard that proverb before and said, I don't see why that's significant and I don't see why it's the sluggard who says that. But here's why the sluggard says it. The sluggard is looking for a reason to do what he doesn't want to do. The sluggard finds a convenient reason in the fact that maybe there's rumors of a lion being outside. And so the sluggard doesn't have to go to work today because if I go out to work today, I might get eaten in the streets. I was thinking about this uh, because a couple of years ago, we actually discovered a bear in our neighborhood. Now, some of you who live farther Toward the Everglades, you know, this is a regular occurrence, but this is not a regular occurrence. Where we live, there was a bear actually in our yard. And, and I was thinking to myself, man, it could be a convenient excuse. You know, I, I like to ride my bike to work frequently and I think I could say, you know, well, I can't go to work today. I mean, there's a, there's a bear out there. There's a bear, I could get eaten. And you know what? The truth is the sluggard's right. He could potentially get eaten by a lion and I could potentially get eaten by a bear. But the odds of that happening are surprisingly slim. (laughs) But for the sluggard, there's no such thing as an irrational fear because this is the convenient way to avoid doing what love for God and love for neighbor requires. Now, as a culture, we've spent the last year dealing with fear, particularly fear related to COVID. And some of those fears are real and not imagined and they're not irrational. And yet for many of us, those who aren't particularly vulnerable and aren't particularly susceptible to this disease, many of us, our lives have been controlled by irrational fear. And it has become a convenient excuse for us not to do the things that love for God and love for neighbor require. I'm not making a judgment on any way any particular person has responded to it, but it's an important question for us to ask ourselves, not only in that area, but in every part of your life. Where are you letting an irrational fear keep you from doing what love for God and love for neighbor require? And you may be chalking it up to something else altogether, when in fact, maybe it's the sin of sloth at work in you. Think about how some of these irrational fears play out in your life. You might be saying to yourself, you might feel compelled, you might say, you know what, I really 
I, I, I know that God's put it on my heart to share the gospel with my neighbor, but I'm afraid to do it because I might mess them up for life. You know, there's a possibility that could happen, but it's a very slim chance. And yet you allow that fear to keep you from acting. Or I, 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 I've heard the call for people to come and volunteer, be part of our production team. I know that our, our needs for technology in the booth have really gone up this year because of all we're trying to do. And, and I know that that might be something I could do, but, but what if I'm working cameras? And by the way, we need people to work cameras desperately. We almost had our pastors working them this week. That's how desperate we are for volunteers. But you know, maybe, maybe I could do that, but you know what? What if I mess up and, and I, what if I fail? And so you allow that fear to keep you from doing what you otherwise could do out of love for God and love for your fellow brothers and sisters. There's all kinds of ways we allow fear to keep us from doing what love requires. And the Bible, I believe, would have us see this as not just problematic, but a sin, and a sin connected with that of sloth. You see, when we allow fear to keep us from doing what we actually should be doing, What we then do is we occupy our lives with things that don't matter. William Carey, the father of modern missions, said, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. And a lot of us, we're afraid to fail at things that do matter. And so we then spend our lives becoming successful at stuff that doesn't. Ask yourself if that's at work in your own life and heart? Have I given away my life to trivialities because I'm afraid that I'm gonna mess up the really big things? A second symptom of slothfulness is a refusal to act due to laziness. Now this is what we traditionally would ascribe to sloth, basically a refusal to do something because you're just lazy. This is the one turning on like a door on its hinges. Proverbs 21, 25, 26 says this about the sluggard. The desire of the sluggard kills him for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves. His desire ultimately kills him, but he refuses to work. One commentator says the sluggard lives in his world of wishing, which is his substitute for working. It can ruin him materially and imprison him spiritually for he can neither command himself nor escape himself. He is miserable. He's miserable. He has all of these desires and all of these things he wishes were different than they are right now, but he allows his wishing to substitute for actually working and doing something about it. What part of your life are you substituting wishing for working? That's not freedom. That's not freedom. That's not joy, that's not life. You see how sloth robs you of life as it's meant to be? You're a prisoner to yourself, to this sin in particular. There are many things in life that require work besides our actual work and vocation. How many people wish that they had a marriage that was life-giving and enjoyable and pleasant? but won't do the work that having such a relationship requires. How many of you wish you were spiritually mature and that you were able to think biblically about problems and challenges in life, but but, but you won't do the work of actually reading and studying the Bible and reading other books and having conversations because it's, it's effort. So you just wish you were farther along in your journey with Christ, but you never actually do anything to get there. How many of you wish that that your health was in a better situation than it is right now, but you won't do the work? You wish financially you were in a better situation, but you won't do the work of putting together a budget or, or, or paying off bills and denying yourself certain pleasures now. There are all kinds of ways we see this refusal to act in our life due to nothing else but sheer laziness. And you may have written it off as just I'm lazy and I don't want to do it, but what I've been confronted with this week is that this is sin. 
That, that loving my family well requires that I do some of these things that I'm avoiding. That loving God well requires that I do some of these things that I'm avoiding. Brian Wilkerson writes, how many dreams have died? How many relationships have suffered? How many plans have been aborted? How many initiatives have failed simply for lack of effort? More than we would like to admit. And sloth is right there at the very heart of it. A second symptom of sloth is unnecessarily delaying action. The first symptom is a refusal to act, but the second symptom is unnecessarily delaying the action of what we know we should do. This is what we commonly refer to as procrastination. Now, uh, I, you know as well as I do, procrastination isn't doing nothing. Procrastination is doing everything you could possibly do except the one thing that you really need to do, right? And I hate procrastination. I hate it with a passion because I see it show up in my life all kinds of ways. I hate it, and yet it often feels to me like if it weren't for procrastination, I wouldn't get anything done. But it's because I am so good at avoiding the one thing I really should do that I get all kinds of other things done, which of course is, is quite fine, but and the problem is I'm, I'm really, I'm avoiding the, the one thing that love of God or love for my neighbor demands be done first. And maybe I avoid it altogether and never ultimately get around to it. Derek Kidner describes this person in these words. He says, through shirking hard work, the sluggard has qualified for drudgery. And through procrastination, the disorder of his life has become irreversible. In other words, if you make a practice of avoiding doing the hard thing and shirking hard work, you ultimately qualify for the life of drudgery you're going to have. That's what he's saying. And if you make a practice of, of procrastinating and putting off the thing that love for God and love for neighbor actually requires to be done now, and you just make a practice of delaying it and delaying and delaying and putting it off, eventually some of those decisions are going to be irreversible. Opportunities are going to be missed that won't, that won't come again. This is procrastination. I um, was reading a book a number of years ago to try to get some of my life in order that I felt like was out of order. It's a book by a man named David Allen called Getting Things Done. How many of you have read this book? Yeah, just like, I expected more from you. Uh, <laughs> I expected more from you. In any case, maybe it's not a problem for you. <laughs> anyway, anyway as I, I, I actually didn't finish the book, ironically. But <laughs> as when we talk, well, there's this really great concept in the book where he talks about creating a someday list. And the idea is all of the things you've thought about doing someday, you should put them down on a piece of paper. And, and then, you know, as you have time and opportunity, you go back and you work out that someday list and you get those things done. And I did that and I really like this list and I've kept that list for a number of years and I keep adding things to it. But when I revisit it now, that list, it, it, it now mocks me <laughs> because it keeps getting longer and nothing seems to ever get crossed off the list. And so I just keep adding to the list of things that someday I will get about doing this, but that day never seems to come. Now, some of those things on the list should never see the light of day, for sure. And probably some of the things on your someday list should never see the light of day. But there are probably things on your list, just like on my list, that, that would be wonderful ways for me to love God and love my neighbor. That there would be people whose lives would be impacted and blessed if the things went from being someday to today. And I wonder about you, what are those things on your someday list that, that would reflect love for God and love for your neighbor that never go from someday to today? Maybe you've said to yourself, you know, it's someday I'm going to start a Bible study in my neighborhood and we're going to, it's going to be a way to get to know some folks and maybe a way to lead some people to Christ who don't know him, at least introduce them to him. Someday I'm going to do that. But you know what? That's been years ago. When is someday going to become today? 
where you said, you know what, I, we need more small groups at Covenant. I think I could do that. Someday I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna make myself available. I'm gonna form a small group. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna help do that for our church. And, and again, I ask you, when does someday become this week? You see, the sluggard doesn't like to move things from someday to today. He's quite comfortable with them being in the future, as we'll see in this next sign of being slothful, and that is an unwillingness to make a commitment. The slothful person is unwillingness to make a, is unwilling to ultimately make a commitment. And here's how we might put it. When we ask the sluggard, how long or when, we're being too definite for him. They don't like to be tied down by those kind of words. He doesn't know. He does not commit himself to a refusal, but deceives himself by the smallness of his surrenders. And so by inches and minutes, his opportunity slips away. The sluggard is not ready, never ready to say when someday is going to become today because that would require committing himself to something and he just won't do it. This is a major problem for us culturally, this inability and unwillingness to make a commitment. And this is related to the sin of sloth. It's no surprise that in our culture, it is far more common now to move in with a person and sleep with them than it is to ask them to marry you and actually make that commitment. Why? Well, because one requires you actually make a commitment and the other doesn't. This is a problem of sloth, among other things. It's no surprise that fewer and fewer people are getting married because what a commitment that requires to say to this one person, it's you and you alone for the rest of my life. Sloth is part of the reason why we can't make that commitment. It's ubiquitous in churches across America that when you have something that you're offering to people and you ask them to sign up, that nobody hardly signs up until the last minute. Why is this? Because we don't want to be committed to something in particular. We're afraid, of course, that something better is going to come up and we've already committed ourselves to this and then we'll have to follow through with it. So when is, when is it, time for you to do whatever it is that God has put on your heart that you've been avoiding doing for him or for your neighbor that has to this point been someday, when is, are you ready to say, you know, this week, today? A fourth symptom of sloth is the inability to finish something. So, of course, the sloth is we refuse to act to begin with, or we delay acting, or we actually do act and we get started, but we're never seemingly able to get to the end of the project. Proverbs 26, 15 describes the sluggard again when he says, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. Now, after my sermon on gluttony last week, you know this isn't my problem. I'm... <laughs> I'm well able to do that motion many times. But the, the, the example here is intended to be humorous about how, just how lazy and uncommitted the sluggard actually is. They'll bury their hand in the dish, but it's just too much effort to finish the job and put the food to their face. Do you have an inability to finish things that you start? Does your house reveal an inability to finish projects that you've begun? Do you have a bookshelf stacked with books with a bookmark in them somewhere between page 20 and 78, but never quite making it to the end? To be clear, some things, projects aren't worth finishing and some books aren't worth finishing and reading to the end, but is this a pattern in your life? That you finally do make a commitment and you say, I'm going to do this, and then you never get to the end. Do you, every year, do you find yourself restarting a Bible reading plan that you've ever actually gotten to the end of the year before? I would say, keep going after it and start again. But, but is this a pattern, this inability to finish things that you've started? You know, you might listen to, about this to the sluggard, if you're, particularly if you're not very self-aware. And you might listen to this and you say, what kind of person lives like this? Who are these people who are just like 
so lazy that they can't get started. And once they start, they can't finish and they won't commit. And I mean, I can't imagine living my life that way. Derek Kidner again says, the wise man will learn while there is time. He knows that the sluggard is no freak, but as often as not, an ordinary man who's made too many excuses, too many refusals, and too many postponements. And it's all been as imperceptible and as pleasant as falling asleep. The person who struggles with sloth is not a freak of nature. They're ordinary people like me and like you who just make a pattern of not doing what love for God and neighbor requires or putting it off or not finishing it once we've begun. It's us. We're those people. The fifth symptom of sloth is chronic busyness. It's possible that a person who is chronically busy is chronically busy doing actions of love for God and for their neighbor, but it's probably even more likely that the person who's chronically busy is chronically busy because they're avoiding doing what love for God and love for neighbor requires. And our busyness becomes a way of not facing what we actually are called to face with regard to our relationship with God or our family, our community, those around us. John Cassian was an ancient church father who was a monastic guy, he did a lot of thinking about this. This sin, by the way, was particularly highlighted and dealt with in monastic communities, but, um, but he has this to say. He describes the sin he's talking about here as acedia, is what we're talking about as sloth today. This is what he says. He says, it's a restlessness that entices us to pursue everything but our most important duties. Acedia distracts. It makes us lazy and sluggish toward our spiritual and practical responsibilities. It is a selective laziness that makes everything else appealing. So we, re- we know, you know, we know, I want, to, I, I want to open my Bible and read God's word, but suddenly we think of 50 things that we need to do first. Right, love for God means I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this time to God, and I'm gonna spend time with him, but, but I can't do it yet because now I, all this other stuff just came to my mind that I have to get about doing. Or I know I need to make a phone call and, and, and start to heal this broken relationship, but you know what? If I just keep myself busy and distracted enough, I can, really, I can put down the pain of, of this relationship being broken and never face up to it and deal with it. This is sometimes what's behind a person who's working 100 hours a week is to avoid the responsibility to love their family because working's easier. Do you see this sin at work in your own life in any of these kinds of ways? You know, sometimes we can get so busy even serving the church that we do it as a way of avoiding giving God what he deserves. Jesus addresses this sin with the two sisters, Mary and Martha. Martha, so busy serving, so busy serving. And what does Jesus say to her? He says to her, one thing is necessary. And Mary's chosen the better portion. And what he was talking about was loving him. And her service at that point wasn't about loving him. And so it can be for us as well. So what is happening deeper in our hearts that is manifesting itself in these various symptoms? What's the underlying cause of sloth? I believe we look back to our story in Numbers and we can find the answer. In the next book after Numbers, in Deuteronomy, what we discover is Moses is preaching a sermon and he's explaining to the people some 40 years after the fact that they refused to go up and do what love required and go and take the land. He's explaining to them why they refused to do that. And what he says in, uh, is he recounts to them God's words to them in verses 29 and 30, where God said to Moses, uh, through, to the people through Moses, do not be in dread or afraid of them, that is, the people who are dwelling in the land. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So God told them he was gonna give them the land and God said, don't be afraid of the people who are in the land. I'm gonna go with you and I'm gonna fight for you to take that land. 
He said he's gonna do that. He didn't say it was gonna be easy. He didn't say there wasn't gonna be sacrifices made. He didn't say it was gonna be costly, but, but he said, but I'm gonna be with you and I'm gonna go into it with you and you're going to have victory here. And how do the people respond? We read in verse 32, yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God. This was the fundamental issue for their slothfulness in refusing to go up and do what love required. They did not believe the Lord. Not that they were unbelievers altogether. Of course, they believed in God's existence, but they did not believe that he was going to go with them and fight with them and for them against these foes. So they looked ahead. They saw it was gonna be a tough road. They saw that there were gonna be sacrifices to be made and this was gonna be costly obedience. And then they looked at God who said, I'm gonna go with you, go on up, I'm gonna go. And they said, we don't trust you. And so we're gonna avoid doing what love requires and we're gonna do our own thing. And how does that end up for them? It ends badly. It ends badly, it ends in death. It ends in 40 years wandering through the wilderness. And so sloth robs us of life. It robs us of life when we don't trust God, that he's going to go with us, that he's going to fight for us. You see, why do we procrastinate on things? Why do we avoid the things that are before us that love for God and love for neighbor require? We avoid them because they're hard. There's a reason why it's easy for me to research sloth from the Goonies for an hour instead of actually writing my sermon. (laughs) Because it's easier to Google stuff than it is to actually write a sermon. And so why do we avoid making that difficult phone call where we have a relationship that's broken we need to fix? Because it's tough. Because we're we're maybe afraid. We know it's gonna be hard. And, and, And what does God say? He says, but this is what I want you to do. Go on up and do it. I'm gonna be with you. I'm gonna fight for you. I'm not gonna leave you alone in this. Yeah, it's gonna be costly. It might be hard, but but I'm gonna be with you. And what do we do in that moment? Do we say, yes, I trust you, I believe, I'm gonna do what love requires? Or do we say, I'm gonna go my own way because I think it'll be easier. And when we do that, we're just like the Israelites and we should expect to see the same kind of misery invade our lives, which is exactly what happens when we're given to sloth. Now, as I'm talking about these things, you might be saying to yourself, man, I realize there's like a hundred things I need to be doing right now. And if sloth is your particular problem, then that's a especially bad thought. All the things that you know you really need to be doing. And it can be overwhelming. And it may paralyze you and keep you from doing anything at all. You see, that's essentially what happened to the Israelites. They looked into the land and they saw all the enemies. The Jebusites and the the Hivites and the the Canaanites. and, and, And they saw them all at once. Instead of recognizing, you know what, these are, this is one problem after another to be dealt with, not all at once. And the things on our someday list are not things that we need to do all at once, the things we do one at a time as God directs us and as he gives us opportunity and, and desire. And so we need to see them one at a time and we need to approach them one at a time and we need to believe one at a time that God is gonna be with us in this and he's gonna fight for us in this. And the same is true as we think about our spiritual life and the sin that remains. Even as we talk about these seven sins, you might feel overwhelmed with all of them and say, oh my gosh, I can, how am I even gonna to begin to put all these seven to death? And, and you may be intimidated by the strength of the enemy at work. No, no, one at a time. and He'll be with you to fight this one. And the next one, and the next one. What is the cure then for sloth? If the problem is fundamentally that sloth leads us to avoid doing the things that love requires because it's hard and difficult and costly, then the cure has to be a love that is able to overcome those difficulties and do what love requires anyway. But you might be thinking to yourself, Pastor Chris was helpful after the first service pointing this out. You might be thinking to yourself, I don't want one thing to do, let alone a hundred things to do. And so what I want to tell you is that this cure is good news because it's not about something that you do. The cure for sloth is about something Jesus did for you. 
It's not about one more thing you have to do still. It's about looking to and recognizing what Jesus has already done. You see, as you read the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, what you discover is that never once did Jesus avoid doing what love demanded. Never once did he avoid it. Not only did he never commit any sins of commission, he never committed any sins of omission. He always did what love required for God and for neighbor in every situation he was in. And so when you read his life, you see when people needed him to listen and to be present, he listened and he was present. And when people needed him to speak a word of rebuke and correction, he spoke a word of correction and rebuke. When people needed a healing, he gave them a healing He disciplined himself in silence and solitude and prayer and in the study of scripture so that he was able to give what people needed as love for God and love for neighbor required. Jesus did all of this. And of course, we see most plainly of all that after having lived his life perfectly to this end, then when love demanded, he'd go to a cross to die for his slothful people who are so quick to run from what love requires. He didn't run. He didn't avoid it. He went and set his face like flint to go to the cross for sloths like you and me. And he suffered there and he died for your sins of sloth and mine. And this is what 1 John 3, 16 tells us. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he took away all of the condemnation condemnation that your sloth deserves and mine. If you've put your trust in Jesus, as David reminded us, you're not condemned. You might be convicted today, as I have been, but you're not condemned. The blood of Jesus has covered all of your sin. And now, knowing that, not only has he covered all of your sin, but actually when you put your trust in Jesus, all of Jesus' perfect record of loving God and loving his neighbor, it's actually credited to your account. So not only are you not held guilty for your sin of sloth, but God actually treats you and rewards you as righteous as though you have actually done everything that love required. So he delights over you with singing. He loves you. You're his beloved child. You belong to him. And if it was true for the people of Israel, it's no less true for you. He's going to be with you. As you go on and you seek to put this sin to death in your life, what do you have to be afraid of when this God is on your side? When this God says, I'm going to fight for you, the one who went to the cross to bear your sin, to set you free, what what are you avoiding that you're afraid of? Christ lived for God and he lived for his people and he gave his life up for us all. Why? So that we might have life and life abundant, the very life that the sin of sloth is stealing from you and me. That's why he did it. So then, in response to this love, the one that sets you free and that's paid the debt you could never pay and that has finished the work, in response to that love, then what do we do? Well, first of all, know that your identity is in Christ. And know what that means. You might think of yourself like an Israelite as you face difficult tasks and challenges ahead of yourself and you say, in light of all of these things, I'm like a grasshopper. Like a grasshopper compared to my problems compared to what God has called me to do. Well, you may actually be like a grasshopper, but that doesn't do full justice to who you are because you're a child of the king. You belong to him and his Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So start thinking of yourself in light of what the gospel says about you. Secondly, don't quit or seek to escape. As we start to do the actions of love for God and love for neighbor, sometimes we find these are not one-off things. You know, loving my family isn't like something I do once a week at three o'clock in the afternoon. And nor is it for you. That's a day in, day out investment of time and energy into people. And that can be difficult. Sometimes it can feel like drudgery. And so we get tempted to escape. And we find discovered Netflix. And it's really easy to escape the drudgery of my life or my calling that sometimes is really hard by just getting lost in show after show. Or we turn to food. Or we turn to other kinds of entertainment or whatever it happens to be. But we we seek to escape the pain of the present moment rather than embracing it as part of the love demonstrated for God and for neighbor 
in light of the love that's been demonstrated to us. Or we go on in our Christian life and you know, we find out, you know what? There are aspects of being a Christian that require daily discipline. And they don't always create a sense of fireworks in my heart. Sometimes it just feels like I'm disciplining myself. And in fact, that's often what it is. And in the Puritan Thomas Manton writes, everlasting joys will not drop into the mouth of the lazy soul. These things are not trifles. They will cost us diligence and seriousness. And that's true about everything that's worth having in this world. A good marriage isn't just going to drop into your lap. You actually have to work for that. You have to invest in that. But not just pulling yourself up from your bootstrap, but by going back to your identity in Christ and who you are and what he's done for you, and then in light of that, beginning to build and to do what we've been avoiding doing. Then finally, live fully. Live fully. The words that Paul says in Colossians 3 are true for all of us. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive your inheritance as a reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, work at it heartily. There's no place for sluggardliness and slothfulness in the Christian life because everything we do, we want to do out of love for God and love for our neighbor. We want to work heartily at it. And sloth is robbing you from the joy of living fully. Jesus came to give you life, to give you life abundantly. Sloth aims to rob you of it. Who are you going to give yourself to? Jesus or sloth? When we give ourselves to sloth, it robs God of the glory due him. It robs our neighbor of the good do them. And it robs us of the joy of doing it. Jonathan Edwards, early in his life, wrote a series of resolutions to live by. And one of them is this, resolved to live with all my might while I do live. So long as I live, I'm gonna live with all my might. I interpret that as meaning, as I have opportunity to love God and love my neighbor, I'm going to do it with all that's in me because of the love with which I have been loved. And when you are aware of that love, then you can grasp what the hymn writer meant when he wrote those words, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's the love of Christ that I'm inviting you to know and embrace and embrace again and again because this love calls us to a full and abundant life now and forever. Let's put sloth to death by the Spirit and embrace this life that Jesus offers us. Would you pray with me to that end? Lord, we confess and I confess, as I have many times this week, that I've gone along with sloth and allowed it to rob me of the joy of serving you, loving others and loving you. And I pray for myself and for all of us that we won't go on any further, that we'll put this sin to death by embracing our identity in Jesus, embracing the finished work of the cross and all that it represents, that we would not cower or be in fear of the difficult things that are before us, but that we would take them one at a time, trusting that you will go with us and that you will fight for us, that we have nothing to dread or fear when we're leaning on your everlasting arms. So work this in us, we pray, ultimately, for your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.